Good morning and welcome to Bazaar Morning Call. I am Anuj. With me, Prashant and Sonia. Of course, uh, we are in festive colors. Today is Navratri, so season's greetings to everyone. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, may this festive season be full of uh, happiness and prosperity and health, most importantly for for all of you. Uh, happy Navratri, guys. Happy Navratri, Happy Navratri and guys. of course uh, the Sera tomorrow and I think after so many years right people are celebrating all the festivals in all its glory so it's really great I mean when you step out there you go and see the celebrations not just for Navratri for Ganpati now the Sera coming up I mean all around there is this festive cheer and I'm frankly very very happy that everything's come back. Absolutely, absolutely. I think the human uh, race is resilient and I think uh, that's what you're seeing and that's what we hope that you know uh, we've truly put behind are the worst and uh, can now go back to celebrating our festivals like we used to. Okay, for the market, uh, what do we have? We have a full global risk on which is visible again. Uh, I mean, the things keep changing, right? Uh, Friday, we had a massive rally. Yesterday, we had a big decline. And today, once again, it looks like we'll have a big rally. I'm talking about India, of course. Uh, the dollar has been quite benign, actually, after going to those levels of 115, back to 111.65. So that's helping. And I was noticing emerging market yesterday, the MSCI emerging market index had one of the best days. Uh, so uh, the big question is, can we have a powerful short covering rally. The SGX Nifty is actually indicating that we'll regain all of yesterday's lost ground and some more, which is going to be very interesting. Let's see how the day pans out, actually. Oh, absolutely. It's a big, big gap up, right? And uh, just tying it up with the festive cheer, perhaps, mm -hmm. as we head into this era, the bulls would like that. Uh, it was not just a relief rally across the U.S. markets where the Dow had a big move, almost a 800-point bump up. But even for our own markets, FII's have bought in cash after, what, about eight days of selling, right? Albeit the number may be a small amount, but nevertheless, at least the selling has been arrested, which is great. Uh, the other thing that stood out for me is that uh, corporate India is seeing a good improvement across the board, not just in the auto sales. Yesterday, we saw Avenue Supermarts report its highest ever quarterly revenues. So consumption is back in a big way. m and Finance came out with a business update. We'll get you more details, but there is an improvement in asset quality. And overall metrics are looking good. HDFC has seen almost a 30% improvement in its loans assigned. Um, so corporate India health is intact and it's improving, which is a great sign uh, for a bull market. And a couple of things to watch. Perhaps we'll now go headlong into the earnings season from the next fortnight. So you have Vipro and Infosys that come out on 12th and 13th respectively. And IT is definitely in focus after the big drubbing it's had over the last many weeks and months. But purely for today, Anuj, there's a relief rally that's going to play out. The big question, of course, is whether that gets sold into because that was a trend that the market was seeing over the last many days. You know, if I were to stick my neck out, I think today's rally does not get sold into, uh, Sonia. Today, in fact, the market trapped shorts uh, and big time. Uh, and, you know, this is because yesterday we had a big decline and the market took support. When the market takes support at a crucial level, the 200 exponential moving average, which is what we spoke about yesterday as well, 16,878, that got protected and the market will have a big gap up. I think the level to watch is now 17,200. I know there's going to be some resistance between 17,100 where we'll open and 17,200. Thrice last week, uh, thrice, uh, the Nifty went to 17,200, almost 17,175, 17,187, 17,180, there about three occasions and it fell from there. So obviously that level is some resistance for the market, but let's see if you can take that out. Uh, but what Today's price action will now confirm is that the low recently, 16,747, uh, last Friday's low, now that becomes line in sand. I think for me, the most fascinating aspect of trade has been how FIs have been shorting in FNO. In fact, yesterday also, there was such a huge shorting, 87% shorts now and net shorts at 1.27 lakh contracts. So my sense is these shorts have to cover. Uh, provided 17,200 is taken out, which could actually happen. Now, I think the index to focus on today is Nifty Financial Services. It's the Tuesday, weekly options expiry on Fin Nifty. And I was just looking at the options data yesterday. There's heavy call writing at 17,500 to 17,800. And this uh, instrument actually has become very active now on Mondays and Tuesdays. It sees a lot of volumes at par with Bank Nifty. So it's a combination of uh, all the banks and NBFC. So uh, an important index to you know keep on your radar every Tuesday. My sense is that would be the the one area where even after a gap up, perhaps if you if you get in uh, on the option side, you might get something here because uh, you know this uh, this has taken support at a big crucial level and is moving on. Let's see, uh, Prashant, high morning. 
Uh, morning, guys. Uh, you know, if U.S. is the big one, right, uh, in terms of what happens there, uh, say, for example, we come back tomorrow and the U.S. is down 3%, will we again be all nervous here? Mm -hmm. It's possible. Is it possible that the U.S. continues to rally for a bit longer? That's the question that I, uh, I'm uh, try, going to try and uh, sort of not answer, but put some facts on the uh, table. Uh, it's possible. And the reason I'm saying this is because, uh, let's just uh, have the graphics up. Uh, you know, there are two, uh, two ways to look at this. There is breadth. Uh, and there is momentum. Uh, both in the US, as I will tell you, have uh, gotten to a bit of an extreme. Uh, so, you know, uh, how are we measuring breadth? We're measuring breadth with the number of stocks which are above the 200-day moving average and below the 200-day moving average. And how are we measuring momentum? We are measuring momentum with the relative strength index, which is the RSI. RSI above 70 indicates overbought. RSI uh, under 30 indicates oversold. Both these uh, indicators, that is the breadth indicator and the momentum indicator, have converged at an extreme low point. The number of stocks below the 200-day, the number of stocks which where RSI is less than 30, I mean, both are at extremes. This overlap between these two indicators is, has happened just seven times uh, since the year 2000. I'll tell you when this happened. It happened in 2001, 2002, 2008, 2011, 2015, 18, and 20. So seven times this overlap has happened at extremes, uh, you know, over the last 20, 22 years. And guess what? Over the next three months, uh, the, you know, the S&P 500, and this is all based on S&P 500 data, over the next three months, the S&P 500 moved up uh, on an average by 13%. Uh, that is uh, one three. That is significant. Now, uh, there is only uh, one occasion out of the seven, six occasions you got 13% move. One occasion was 2008, when after a convergence of both these indicators, the US market fell another 5%. So, you know, uh, it, uh, there is always uh, exceptions to the rule, uh, but uh, we'll just need to see. So the point I'm making is it's possible we are at one of those junctures where it got to so extreme in the U.S. that you get a bit of a bounce. Not to say that uh, it'll be the start of another uh, sort of, you know, fresh bull move or anything of that sort, but the fact is a meaningful bounce is possible. Uh, history points to that particular uh, fact. Now, coming to uh, sort of, you know, just a couple of points here. Uh, so relief in U.S. and, of course, relief in the dollar, which is weakened, uh, is a very welcome outcome. I mean, more than equities, it's the dollar. The dollar from 100, almost 115, 116 is now at 100, under 112. Uh, so that is uh, very, very positive. Uh, watch out for oil prices. I mean, so on Wednesday, uh, that is uh, tomorrow, we've got the uh, OPEC Plus, which is meeting. And there are reports, Reuters reports, etc. And I think some OPEC Plus delegates yesterday also said that they're considering a pretty large uh, oil price, uh, oil output cut, production cut, by about a million barrels per day. If this output cut to that quantum were to come through, it will be one of the uh, sort of largest cuts in one of the tightest markets ever in terms of supply and demand. Uh, so, uh, you know, if that happens, it would put upward pressure on oil, and oil is important uh, for a big importer like India. Uh, we've seen very large intraday moves up, down, all over the place. So, I mean, trading the index itself has been uh, pretty tough. Uh, but uh, to begin with, Friday's high, I think, is uh, the one to watch out for. I think Anuj also related to 17,200. The exact level there is about 17,187. That's the first stop for bulls. But the SGX indicating that we may take that out right at the start, right at the beginning. Sonia. Absolutely. And the big, big question is, is the worst over in terms of the equity market fall, right? I mean, September was a really tough month and oh, yeah. investors endured a hard month. Now, with September like firmly in the rearview mirror, the the prognosis at least is or at least the question is that everyone's asking is the worst of the fall now globally you know, behind Anuj us, was right? talking about the uh, emerge, MSCI emerging market index so we are just entering into October MSCI emerging market in September had the worst month mm. since March of 2020 mm. so I mean you're coming out of a pretty bad, uh, bad phase patch. as you said yes, uh, in September okay so let's see is this only a relief rally or is it going to be uh, the bottom for the global markets. That's the big question that we're asking. And lots of experts lined up in the next two and a half hours. For now, of course, the market is, the SGX Nifty is indicating a huge bump up opening this morning, up about 250 odd points. But on the equity front, first up, we have Gautam Dugar of Motila Loswal Financial Services, who says that they expect the market to be driven by corporate earnings, which commence next week. RBI's 50 basis points rate hike and the soothing commentary has calmed the nerves to an extent. However, global macros need to settle for any clear direction to emerge in the near term. 
inflation, rate high, currency moves and liquidity still form the bedrock of investor conversations. Okay, let's get you some money market views then. Bhaskar Pand of HDFC Bank says that overnight risk assets have rallied, uh, boiling over to Asia. Weak uh, US ISM data and sideways movement in dollar index may help a bit. But OPEC plus meeting to discuss cut in oil production has pushed up oil prices. USD INR is expected to take a breather after yesterday's rally, riding on global headwinds. He expects the USD INR pair to trade in a range between 81.50 to 81.75. Actually, that's that's right, right? You you win some, you lose some. Uh, everything is up, so crude is also up, right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, on the bonds, then Bhaskar Panda says that they have now readjusted to the new reality post the RBI policy decision to hike rates. The 10-year benchmark yield is expected to trade in a range between 7.45 to 7.50 percent today. All right, so that's on the macros. Uh, the U.S. futures, though, are indicating continued gains for the market, so do keep an eye out on that. Not just did we have a rally yet overnight, but even later in the evening, the indications are that the rally would continue across the globe and hence SGX Nifty at the highest point. We have lots of stock-specific action to track today as well. We'll get to that in just a bit in our special top 10 segment. We're looking at HDFC, Indusind Bank, m and Finance, Hindustan Zinc, Vedanta, Avenue Supermarts, Mahanagar Gas, Bank of Maharashtra and Angel One that's on our radar on the back of positive news flow. And Marico is the only stock that is likely to open in the red. Ed Yardini is joining us now. He's president at Yardini Research. Uh, Ed, great to have you with us here. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, in the U.S., Ed, uh, are we, uh, could, could this be one of those meaningful bounces? Well, I think it's a meaningful bounce. I mean, just what we had today was quite meaningful. Uh, you know, 2.6% uh, or so uh, in one day uh, after a, an entire week where we were down 2.9%. So it's a pretty impressive uh, rebound. Uh, I think it's partly because the uh, purchasing manager's data was uh, weaker than expected, uh, which uh, suggests that uh, the Fed's tightening uh, may, may not uh, be quite as severe as uh, people feared. Okay, may not be as severe as what people feared. Well, Ed, um, you know, we were just debating as to is this the end of the a bear phase for global equity markets, or is it just a relief rally? Uh, what's your best guess of how things could shape up from here? I think it's a relief rally. I'm not particularly bearish. I think the market's going to go sideways with a lot of volatility. Uh, we're still going to have the Federal Reserve raising the Fed funds rate at their November meeting. That'll be early November. So in about a month, we're probably going to get another 75 basis point increase in the Fed funds rate. Uh, but a lot can happen in, in one month, as we just saw in September. And it does feel as though September was the worst month. Uh, uh, it, was, it was a bad month uh, historically. And October sometimes uh, does better, especially if September created some buying opportunities. So I, I think the worst is over in terms of the downside. But I don't see a tremendous amount of upside anytime soon. I think we, we need to get to a point where the Fed clearly is done tightening. Okay, uh, so we will get a 75 basis point uh, in the U.S. in a month's, so. month's time. Okay, got that. You know, uh, Ed, uh, so much uh, growing sort of chatter whether the Fed will slow its pace of hikes and yes. you know the continued question of a pivot. When is a pivot not really a pivot? Uh, is uh, is is uh, you know the point is <laughs> that it, they may uh, when you say a pivot, what you mean is that you go from tightening to easing. But right. uh, when you just stop tightening, I mean, that is also a pivot, isn't it? I mean, or at least slow the pace of uh, tightening. Correct. Yeah. Correct. I mean, you know, we can call pivots whatever we want. Mm. Uh, when, when, when the Fed changes its opinion, uh, that's a pivot. Mm. Uh, but it uh, sometimes uh, can be based on data that they didn't expect to go the way it went. But we saw as in July, the Fed was still talking about possibly pausing in, in September or November. And uh, in August, they were suddenly talking about just raising interest rates as far as necessary to uh, bring inflation down. So that was a pretty hawkish uh, pivot. And I think the next pivot that the markets are expecting is a more dovish uh, or dovish pivot, or let's call it a less hawkish pivot based on an economy that's slowing down uh, with inflation uh, continuing to moderate. Ed, the big, uh, good morning, the big debate has been on uh, decoupling, right, uh, for emerging markets. Uh, and India, of course, Correct. has done well, but there are other emerging markets as well which have done well. Mm -hmm. But uh, 
can this happen that the US market uh, stays weak while other emerging markets keep rallying? Is, is, is that a possibility? Well, no, I, the way I see it is uh, the, the US, uh, among developed mm. countries, the US is widely viewed as a safe haven, which is why the dollar has been so strong and why money has actually come into the United States. Mm. So I think on a relative basis, the US stock market and bond market will probably do better than some of the stock and bond markets in the other developed countries. Among emerging economies, India stands out as doing particularly well because China's got all sorts of problems and the strong dollar tends to be bad news for emerging markets that have borrowed a lot in dollars, which doesn't seem to be the case for India. So India stands out among emerging economies and the U.S. stands out among developed economies. So since India stands out amongst emerging uh, economies, Ed, do you believe that this is a great buying opportunity for investors here in India, purely because we didn't fall as much when global markets fell. Right. And now corporate uh, you know, data has improved quite a bit, which is right. the, the basis for a bull market, right? Well, I think what India has going for it is that, uh, at least on a relative basis, India looks very good. Uh, so not only does India look good in absolute terms, but to compare it to some of the problems that other emerging markets are having, you know, a lot of emerging economies are very de dependent on selling commodities around the world. And because of the strong dollar and the slowing global economy, commodity prices have been coming down. Uh, we also know that uh, companies like Apple are moving towards India and away from China. And again, that benefits uh, investors who are looking at putting their money in India rather than China. So again, in absolute terms, and also in relative term, India looks good among emerging economies. Hmm. Okay, on relative terms, India looks good amongst emerging economies. Is there any other risk on the horizon now, Ed? Uh, it seems like most of the big risks have now played out as we head into the end of the year. But you tell us, what, does the, what is your own prognosis? No, I, I don't think uh, just because we had one really good day that uh, the, the worst is over. I mean, there, there's still a concern here that inflation might have peaked, but it's not coming down fast enough, which then puts pressure on the Federal Reserve uh, to raise rates more. I, I think there's one more hike coming uh, in November, 75 basis points, and then maybe in December, 50 basis points, and that might be it. But that's actually uh, a fairly contrary view. There are a lot of people, including people at the Fed, who matter a lot more than I do, that think that they're going to be raising interest rates going into the first half of next year. And that could create a problem for something. Something could break, which is what the markets have been concerned about. And as you know, we got this strange situation where as the Fed's raising interest rates, people fear that something will break. But they also believe that if something breaks, the Fed will stop uh, raising rates. So I'm not quite sure whether if something breaks, whether the market goes up or down. <laughs> And, uh, you know, OPEC Plus is talking about taking a million barrels yeah. a day out of the market. Uh, what will mm -hmm. that do to oil prices? Well, uh, I've observed that uh, here in the United States, because of the surge in gasoline prices in the summer, uh, U.S. consumers of gasoline have actually reduced their usage of gasoline in the United States by a, about a million barrels per day. So it looks to me as OPEC is, is trying to basically take that million barrels per day out of the supply side of the oil market. And that kind of leaves oil prices essentially unchanged. I know they were up today on the news, but I don't think we're going to go back to 100. I think we're going to stay in the sort of 80, 90 dollar range. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that uh, winter is coming and Europe's likely to fall into a very severe energy crisis recession. Uh, China is in a recession, as we've discussed before, uh, with regards to their property market. So I think uh, the global demand situation for oil is such that it kind of makes sense for uh, OPEC to reduce their supply if they don't want the price to uh, collapse. Okay, winter is coming. Well, <laughs> for all Game of Thrones fans, uh, winter is coming was well, right. the start of something really terrible, right? I right. didn't know you'd have to wait for that in real life as well. That's right. It's relevant. Okay. Ed, thanks a lot for joining in and uh, all the best.
Have a great Thanks. Uh, week. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Well, that's Ed Yardeni of Yardeni Research saying that uh, the worst is not over just yet. Inflation is still quite high and across the globe we could be headed for another round of a downtick. This was just a relief rally that we've seen overnight. Let's slip into a quick break. On the other side, our entire research team will be with us to give us a list of top 10 stocks. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Bazaar Morning Call. Well, uh, this morning the SGX Nifty is indicating a big bump up opening, but there are plenty of stocks in focus. So let's get straight down to that. Our research team is standing by to give us a list of top 10 stocks. Anuj, let me begin with you. What are you looking at? You know, uh, as I said, today is the day to watch the financial Nifty, uh, Nifty Financial Services. Weekly options expiry. My sense is you see massive short covering here. And uh, the stocks that could lead it are HDFC and HDFC Bank, the, the ones which have the biggest weight in the index and uh, uh, you know so that's something that I'll keep an eye on simple technical reason nothing else nothing more uh, just because you know it's a, there's this weekly expiry and because there are shorts in the system and you would see short covering but uh, let's go across to Abhishek then he also has actually some financials that he's watching out for but because of the business updates uh, Abhishek hi Good morning, Anuj. Uh, to begin with, Indescent Bank, they have gained market share in the loan book. Quarter-on-quarter, uh, -quarter, deposit growth is the best in last uh, five quarters and loan growth is the best in last four quarters. Uh, loan book market share is up five basis point YOY and about seven basis point on a sequential basis. Deposits are up at 14.65% uh, YOY and about 4.2% quarter-on-quarter. Loan growth is pretty robust, coming in at close to 17.6% YOY and about 4.7% quarter-on-quarter, which means that there credit to deposit ratio has improved on the flip side they have lost out on low cost deposits as it is down to 42.4 percent of the deposits when compared to 43.2 percent in the previous quarter m and fin over there the asset quality has surprised positively gross NPA ratio is down to seven percent when compared to eight percent in the previous quarter uh, disbursals are up more than nine percent month on month so for the month of september disbursals were close to 4100 crores collection efficiency has also improved in September to 98% when compared to 96% in August and 96% in June. SDFC Limited, the loans assigned are up 28% uh, YOY but down 4% sequentially. Uh, dividend income is strong over there. Individual loans sold, that is loans sold to, uh, you know, SDFC Bank, uh, that's at a growth of 27% YOY and 6.2% uh, sequentially. Sale of investment remains nil uh, when compared to nil on a YOY basis. Back to you. Okay, thanks a lot for that. So we'll watch out for these stocks, m and Finance, Improvement in Asset Quality and HDFC Limited seeing a 28% growth in loans assigned. But Nigel is here with us to tell us why we should watch Hindustan Zinc and Vedanta this morning. Nigel, over to you. Well, uh, you know, both of them came out with their operational update and that's why we're expecting both the stocks to open up in the green. Now, let's start off with the biggest part of the business. That's the aluminum business for Vedanta. Production numbers up close to around 2% and Jasukada, which is bulk of that aluminum business, that in fact was up by close to around 5%. Moving to the Zinc in India business, that's Hindustan Zinc. Out there as well, numbers look good. The integrated saleable metal, that's both refined uh, zinc as well as refined lead put it together. That was up by close to around 18%. And even saleable silver, that was up by close to around 28% or thereabouts. So thumbs up out there, that's for Hindustan Zinc. For Vedanta, the total power sales as well did come up by close to around 24%. That's uh, the TSPL, which is bulk of their power sales. That as well did jump up by a good 59%. It's international zinc operations, well, that's been seeing some traction. It's good to see that the Gamesburg project out there, well, that's seeing a good ramp up. And that is reflected in the higher production number. Oil and gas has been a bit of a struggle, and that continues to be the case. That's the operational update, but the reason I expect the stocks to fire up is because the dollar has weakened, and also you have the U.S. bond deals, which have cooled off. Always we see that the metal stocks, they react positively. So both of them open up well in the green. All right, uh, Nail, thanks very much uh, for that. Now, Avenue Supermarts and Marico are in focus. Uh, Mangalam is here to tell us why. Mangalam, hi, morning. Well, before the quarterly uh, results, we also got the, get the quarterly updates. And this one comes in from Avenue Supermarts. It's a good quarter that the company has reported. The highest ever quarterly revenue. Year on year, there's a revenue growth of almost 35.7%. Quarter on quarter as well, there's a growth of almost 6 odd percent. And importantly, the company added 8 stores in the second quarter. For Avenue Supermarts, you know, uh, the company now has around 302 stores. But importantly, uh, 108 stores or 118 stores rather were added just in the last three COVID years, which will now begin to see normalized growth. So that provides 
some uh, headroom for growth going forward. And that is something that we've seen over the last few second quarters as well. And this time for the first time around, on a standalone basis, the company's quarterly revenue has crossed that 10,000 crore mark. Valuations-wise, it's never been cheap, but now it's about 25% away from its 52-week high. So see some green on that stock. However, can't say the same for Marico because uh, the India business posted low single-digit volume growth. The consolidated uh, revenue in the quarter grew in low single digits on a year-on-year -year basis as well. And gross margins compressed sequentially because the company had to pass on all the price cuts, but they were sitting on high inventory. As a result of which, the EBITDA margins will stay flat year-on-year. -year. They spent a little more on advertising and the net profit will decline year-on-year, -year, primarily because of higher tax rate. So see some red on Marico because all the recovery hopes in FMCG stocks are pinned for the second half. We're still in the second quarter. Okay, thanks a lot for that. Uh, well, let's talk about MGL and why it's been in focus. Uh, Sonal is here to give us more. Sonal, over to you. Good morning, Sonia. Well, finally, there is some price hike. Uh, the government increased the gas prices by 40% and MGL has gone ahead and increased both CNG and PNG prices in Mumbai. CNG prices have been hiked by 6 rupees per kg and now they cost 86 rupees per kg. PNG, that is the retail connection, is up 4 rupees, that too. 52 and a half rupees per SCM. Now, MGL needed to hike their prices by 9 rupees per kg in the CNG segment post the domestic price hike. Uh, now, a company says that there are a couple of reasons why they've hiked prices. One, of course, the 40% hike in domestic prices. The allocation from the government, according to the company, has also reduced, which has led the company to import or source gas at a higher price at current prices. And that has led uh, to their cost of, uh, cost of uh, sourcing increasing uh, by around 10 to 20%. Now, these prices hikes while good for the margins could impact demand and ultimately volumes so we'll see which way things go for the stock as far as the move today is concerned additionally discount of cng to petrol and diesel is at a multi-year low so definitely there's a possibility of volumes being hit by that but margins of course could be cushioned with this move okay so now thanks a lot for that uh, Sonia Prashant, imagine uh, last year changing your car from diesel to CNG. Uh, <laughs> now go through now the standing roof. on the line and realizing that you're only saving, you know, six or seven rupees. But, but imagine those people who change their car from diesel to electric vehicles and then realizing that there's not enough infrastructure. <laughs> there are power cuts across the board, right? Uh, yeah, so anyway, I mean, uh, things are tough uh, in the energy space. Uh, it's all, all because of the, the global play. But let's go across to Abhishek once again. Uh, he's watching out for a couple of more business updates. Uh, Abhishek? Uh, well, Anush, to begin with, Bank of Maharashtra, it's surprised positively in terms of the jump that you are seeing in credit to deposit ratio. Uh, credit to deposit ratio is up uh, around 400 basis point uh, quarter on quarter and about 12.2% on a uh, YOI basis to 75.7%. That is because the loan growth is robust. The loan growth has come in at 28.65% YOI and about 5.5% sequentially. Deposit growth largely flat on a sequential basis. The CASA ratio, that's heartening to see one of the best in the industry coming in at 56.3% when compared to 53.9% on a YOI basis. And uh, uh, coming on to Angel One, uh, their business update for the month of September has been pretty good. The total clan base is up 3.4% uh, month on month and about 77.4% on a YOI basis. The number of orders that's increased by almost 25% on a month on month basis and about 66% on a YOI basis. Market share in FNO segment has remained is constant while in commodities they have gained market share by 170 basis point back to you all right thanks a lot for that so those are uh, plenty of stocks to watch as we head into a brand new day of trade in case you missed out on any of them here's a quick recap stocks with positive news flow there's hdfc indescent bank m m finance hindustan zinc vedanta avenue supermarts mahanagar gas bank of maharashtra and angel one while the stock with negative news flow is Marico because of the slower growth in the India business that they saw this time around. But let's find out what's happening in the world of commodities. Crude has inched up again. Manisha Gupta is joining in with a roundup of all the action that we've had there overnight. Manisha, good morning. Morning, Sonia. And some <clears throat> excuse me, overnight session it has been for commodities. As you said, the crude oil prices jumped 5% overnight. And this is ahead of the OPEC and Allies meeting, which is slated in Vienna in person tomorrow. And the markets are anticipating a 1 million barrels per day of an output cut. If that happens, then you could be looking at the crude oil prices jumping some more. In the last uh, 8 or 10 trading sessions, we've seen crude prices gain up by $8. And the markets do believe that if this cut actually comes in, you are looking at another 5 to $7 of a gain from here on. But not just crude after UN calling on central banks to halt aggressive rate hikes. Once that started moving into the market and the fact that the U.S. manufacturing activity expanded the least in the last two years, did wonders for the confidence for precious metal prices. 
Silver gained up by 8% overnight. Platinum was up 5%. Gold gained up by 2% as well. So another uh, sector that has done amazingly well has been precious metals overnight. Okay, thanks a lot for that, Manisha. So precious metals uh, seeing a rebound once again. We'll take a quick commercial break. On the other side, we'll connect with Dipan Mehta of Elixir Equities for some fundamental stock analysis. We'll also connect with KK Mystery of HDFC to discuss an outlook on their business. Stay tuned. Welcome back. That's the SGX Nifty indicating that we'll not only gain back what uh, we gave up yesterday, but add some more, 17,130 and who knows that 17,200 mark, given the amount of shots that we have in the system and that they would be in trouble first thing in the morning. Uh, you know, there, there could be an interesting day today. We have Deepan Mehta joining us, Director at Alexa Equities. Deepan, hi, good morning. Thanks a lot for joining us. Uh, so, uh, the market's become very volatile, but... Uh, uh, largely, it's still a resilient market, uh, the Indian market, and banks have been doing well. Uh, your thoughts on how to approach it in incrementally? Yeah, good morning, Anuj, and thanks for having me on your show. You're absolutely right. I think uh, banks have regained leadership position, and uh, for the right reasons, absolutely. I think we've seen the early uh, commentary coming from the sector and some of the banks, and that is extremely positive. Uh, we are seeing very decent uh, net interest income growth rates as well as increases in uh, net credit also. And of course, uh, the credit costs are going to remain pretty much under control for this quarter. So we're looking at a very good earning season for the banking sector. As regards markets, you're right. I think it's showing a great deal of resilience. Partly it's to do with expectation of a very good earning season on the back of a very good festive season as well. So let's just keep our fingers crossed. I think if this earning season is uh, decent as per street expectations, uh, we, we could say that then we are completely out of the woods so long as your U.S. markets, you know, do not uh, fall further from these levels. Also. Okay. Uh, Dipan, hi. Good morning. Uh, it seems like people are shopping a lot more. I mean, look at the Avenue Supermarts numbers, right? Record quarterly revenues, almost a 40% growth there. Uh, the stock, how are you feeling about it? Is the risk reward still favorable for investors? Good morning, Sonia. Absolutely, I think. And um, you know, the way they've been expanding their stores and the footprint uh, which they have created and further the fact that they can even grow this uh, beyond these levels as well means the potential for the stock in the next two, three years is exceptional. At the same time, I think uh, amongst even amongst the organized players, a lot of consolidation has taken place. Future retail is no longer a major player. So there are just two or three of these players in the hypermarket uh, segment of retail and uh, Avenue Supermarkets is one of them. So, and also the, uh, we are seeing the shift away from unorganized to unorganized as well. The only real, uh, I would say, fly in the ointment is the way these online, uh, uh, you know, companies like Big Bazaar and all, how they are trying to get into the space of Avenue Supermarket and how the competition from that will shape up is a bit of uncertainty. But nonetheless, I think despite uh, reasonably high valuations, we're very positive on Avenue Supermarket. It can continue to grow at 25% uh, for at least three, four years, and that would mean a solid compounding story. Okay, solid compounding uh, story. What else, uh, Deepan, uh, with, uh, I mean, you think financials are the best? I mean, if, they, if we get a bit of a risk on move uh, from here, a continued move, uh, are financials the best place uh, to, uh, to, to kind of latch on to? Uh, or, or you think uh, there could be others which participate equally aggressive? Tech, for example, IT services. Last night, we've seen a pretty large move on the NASDAQ. Your sense? Well, Prashant, I think you have to have at least 35% of your portfolio in banks and NBFCs if you expect to beat the Sensex Nifty returns. And this is, I would say, amongst the golden period for the banking sector. You have the best of both worlds. Their costs are low because of low provisioning and net interest income and fee-based income is going to go up because of higher credit growth rates. So it's going to be a great time for banks and NBFCs. You can pick and choose depending upon your risk appetite and your experience with these stocks in the past. Apart from banks, I think we spoke about retail. I mean, across the board, retail looking very interesting. And so many of these new listings, I think, really need to be watched quite closely, like uh, Vedan Fashion, which is Maniavar, Metro Brands, uh, Go Fashion, which is Go Colors. And uh, even to an extent, uh, I would say ethos. I think all of these new retail listings would be quite interesting. They are at a slight discount to existing retail companies like, say, Trent or Avenue, or uh, for that matter, some of the other Aditya uh, Birla fashion. And uh, they are growing at much faster growth rates. 
they have a short listing history, so that's a bit of an uncertainty. But they are solid players, very good market share, strong balance sheet, able to expand their network without uh, taking on any debt or so. So that's where we are focusing on as far as our new investments are concerned. Okay, well, uh, we have plenty of other stocks to talk uh, to you about. So we'll come to that in just a bit. But before that, just a quick word also on, uh, you know, some more stocks that have been in the news. Uh, Hindustan Zinc has seen an 18% growth in its saleable, uh, saleable products, uh, both on Vedanta and Hindustan Zinc. I mean, and, and that entire pocket. What's your view now? Every rally is a reason to sell metal stocks. Okay. I think that metals will not outperform over the next two three years. It's going to be the year. Uh, it's going to be the years for the metal consumers, and that's where we need to focus on engineering, construction companies, real estate companies, automobiles. I think they're all going to do exceptionally well as compared to metals. So I would avoid all metals at this point of time. Lead in. All right. Uh, well, uh, Dipan, just stay on. We'll come to you in just a bit. We have a big voice joining us now. Kiki Mistri joins in to give us a view on how things are shaping up post the interest rate hike, as well as uh, the way forward for the company. Uh, Mr. Mistri, good morning and thanks a lot for joining in. Uh, can you tell us first on the interest rate hikes itself, how has it changed the dynamics in the real estate sector? And, you know, what is the way forward? Uh, do you think we are headed on you know, do, do you expect to see more rate hikes from here on? And what would the impact be? It's a difficult situation for RBI to handle. Uh, my sense is that uh, Fed may continue rate hikes for some time. Uh, however, I do personally believe, and this is after talking to a number of investors, that it is a possibility that somewhere in the second half of next year, U.S. could actually lead to a, to a situation where Fed may actually look to reduce rates and not increase rates any further. So it's a short-lived problem. Uh, we can partly overcome that problem by maybe getting India included in the bond index. If there is, as you know, a JP Morgan bond index and uh, uh, a Bloomberg bond index, which is where, where the uh, index constituents will be decided soon. And if we can get included in the bond index, then that automatically brings in something like 30 to $35 billion into India. If we get 30 $35 billion in India over the next 12 months, that obviates the necessity to increase interest rates uh, every time Fed does it. So that's my personal view. But uh, having said that, till such time as Fed remains aggressive, we might see uh, some more rate hikes in India also. Though I don't believe that, uh, that the rate hikes going forward will be that many or that sharp uh, incrementally. Uh, Mr. Misri, coming to the real estate market itself, wh how, uh, what do you think and uh, how do you think the sector will behave uh, should uh, rates continue to move higher? What is the absorption capacity uh, in a worst-case scenario? For example, if rates move up by another 100 basis points, what do you think will be the impact on growth and margins? On individual loans, our loans get repriced every quarter, every quarter from the day you took the loan, whereas on the liability side, the repricing might be a little faster. So this works both ways when interest rates go up or interest rates go down, but that is a very temporary impact, which is typically there for one or one and a half months and not more than that. But otherwise, margins will remain stable. Now, when you talk of growth, what you must understand that as a housing loan, unlike a consumer durable loan or unlike a auto loan or unlike a bike loan or something like that, is taken for a much longer time frame. Uh, the average term of a housing loan from door to door stretches from 12 to 13 years at the time the loan was taken. Now, over that period of 12 or 13 years, interest rates in India will go up and interest rates will come down. That is a normal automatic phenomenon that we will see. So it really does not make so much difference where interest rates are at the time when you've taken the loan, because if at that point of time rates are high, then at some point of time rates will come down and vice versa. So some news reports suggest that home buyers are becoming a bit cautious now. Are you noticing any such trend? And at what level of interest rates does it start impacting growth or asset quality, you think? Our experience over this last 40 years of business, and particularly so the last 20 plus years when floating rates became popular, is that it, there is no impact, no long term impact on asset quality. Just to give you a sense of asset quality at HDFC on individual loans, individual housing loans, 
from the time we started uh, giving loans in 1977 till today, over a period of 45 years or so, our total loan losses, money we have not been able to recover, has been only 0.06% of the total loans we've dispersed cumulatively over a period of 45 years. So a housing loan is very different from any other product. The family stays in the house. It's the single biggest possession for a family. The amount we finance of a property typically is about 68, 69%. So there is a huge amount of equity that the individual has in the property. And more importantly, a housing loan is an amortizing loan. So the moment you get the loan from the next month itself, you start paying an installment and that installment has got a principal component. So with every passing month, the outstanding amount of the property, outstanding amount of the loan keeps declining. And therefore, for a moment, if you assume that property prices were flat and not rising as they probably could in line with inflation, if you assume property prices were flat, you would see the loan to value ratio keep declining every year, which means the individual's equity in the property keeps increasing. So therefore, usually you find that there is no, no impact on, the, on, the, on, on default or on loan losses. Mr. Misri, uh, are you seeing a pickup in wholesale lending? See, on the wholesale side, there are three categories of loans we have. One is construction finance, the second is uh, lease rental discounting loans, and the third is corporate loans. Now, construction finance, which at one time used to be about 14% of our book, is now come down to about 9% of our book. Now, the primary reason is that the period from 2017 to 2020, or I would say 2017, I would say 17 to 20, did see some amount of slowdown in demand for under construction properties in metros, in cities like Mumbai, Delhi, Bangalore, and so on and so forth. And because there was a slowdown in, in, in demand for under construction properties, there were not that many new projects that were launched. Project launches started again from 2021. So from 2021, again, there has been a sharp pickup in the number of new projects being launched. But between that 2017 to 20 period, launch of new projects had slowed down. Now, in a construction finance loan, unlike a lease rental discounting loan, the disbursement for that loan is made gradually over a period of time. So usually the developer puts in his own equity first, and then the lending institution starts dispersing money as the developer starts constructing. So disbursements tend to be more uh, uh, tend to be more back ended rather than front ended. Whereas in a LRD loan, the disbursement is made upfront. So therefore, you will see a growth in the loan book, in the non-individual non loan book, over a period of time. That's the guidance we've given to investors now for the last uh, couple of quarters. There has been a sharp pickup in the number of new projects being launched. Uh, and therefore, hopefully over a period of time, you will start seeing the non-individual book pick up. Okay. Uh, Mr. Misri, you know, you started funding self-employed category of, uh, you know, loans for housing. Are you witnessing any competition with dominant players in those markets? How is the situation on the ground now? HDFC's individual home loan book grew by 19%, which would include for employed customers and self-employed customers. The housing loan growth in the banking system at the same time was about 16.2%, if memory serves me right. So we grew at a rate which is nearly, nearly 3% faster than what the banks grew at. And you will see something similar happening in March of 2022 and something happening something similar happening the last two to last three or four quarters if you were to look at it so consistently we've been going at a pace which is faster than the banking system is growing there is competition in the market of course there is competition there always has been competition but it's not that competition is you know competition is very realistic competition is not mispricing anything and at the end of the day there is so much of huge such a huge market to cater to no one needs to do anything which is irrational you must remember that the penetration of housing loans in India is one of the lowest in the world at about 11% of GDP. And if you look at that number in Western countries, it's all over 50%, 50%, 60%, 70%, and so on and so forth. But even if you were to look at many emerging markets, the, the mortgage to GDP ratio would be upwards of 20%. We are still 11%. So it's a very underpenetrated market. And my sense is that no one in this market needs to do anything irrational because there is growth opportunity for everyone. 
Uh, Mr. Misri, in the current liquidity environment, are you changing? Uh, are you sort of any thoughts with respect to merger uh, implementation? Uh, anything on that? If you see the last uh, uh, six months or, or so data, the growth of deposits in the banking system has been relatively low compared to the growth of loans in the banking system. But having said that, if you compare the last uh, three, four uh, fortnightly reports, you would see that the percentage is inching up. The total level of deposits are inching up. And what will happen now is as interest rates go, as, as interest rates have gone up quite, quite a lot in the last couple of months, so the benefit of that higher interest rates will ultimately move to the retail depositor. So you will see more people putting or willing to put money in bank deposits going forward compared to what we were seeing in the past. What we saw last year was that deposit rates in India were very low because interest rates were so low. And therefore, for many consumers, many individuals, they preferred to put their investments in some other uh, instrument rather than put money in bank deposits. But with rates going up, that will change. Okay, Mr. Mistri, uh, thanks a lot for joining in and have a great day. Uh, that's the word coming in from KK Mistri. Uh, Dipan Mehta is still sitting by. Dipan, any thoughts on HDFC Limited? I mean, it's you know one of those stocks that doesn't really move much, but a safe stock for long-term investors. Uh, what's your call now? You know, Sonia, it's almost like buying a bond. But the thing is, you know, we look at the thousand-day returns and how they have shaped up as compared to Sensex Nifty. And HDFC has underperformed the Sensex by 26%, HDFC Bank rather, and HDFC by 45%. And I haven't seen this kind of underperformance uh, since the listing of these companies. So I'm quite hopeful that this uh, gap which in returns, which is there, will eventually get filled up once the merged entity comes into play. And this kind of underperformance cannot continue for such an extended period of time, considering that the underlying fundamentals of the company still remain pretty much sound. And growth rates also are at par with the industry or slightly better. It's just that valuations, uh, price to earning, price to book uh, have compressed and uh, they cannot go further lower than these levels in terms of these ratios. And I think the returns going forward will be more or less in line with what the earnings per share growth rates are. And that can easily be in the, I would say, mid double digits or thereabouts. So very positive on both these companies. And uh, I think uh, they should be part of every core holding in every investor's portfolio. Deepan, what, since we're talking about HDFC, what's your view on Campion Homes? Do you think the big short trade is over here and is the risk reward now on the long side? Uh, and would you take a leap of faith now and buy it here? Uh, without knowing you know what exactly are the problems and all i mean but given the 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 track record would you buy it here yeah no it's a great value play and look at the track record i think uh, by and large they have run a very uh, i would say clean business efficient business when the entire banking nbfc space was under pressure uh, this company never reported any blowout in terms of npas or any such situations. They don't have a resource problem because Canada Bank is their sponsor. And largely the loans are to the retail sector. They hardly have any develop developer loans per se. Even the loan against property is a very small component. So depending on how the new leadership uh, you know, uh, shapes up or so, I think the stock looks attractive at these levels. And with the way real estate market is picking up, especially in their, uh, I would say, core geographies of South India, uh, they should have good opportunities to increase the lending book as well. So very positive on Canfin Homes. Only hope that nothing negative comes out uh, from the management in terms of uh, corporate governance or any such uh, negative issues. Okay, well, I do want to ask you about some of these brokerage companies. Angel One reported a very good growth in its client base in September. It went up almost 78% year on year. And I know you track ICIC securities as well. So I'll ask you that on the other side of the break. We have to take a quick commercial break. But up next, we have Sudarshan Sukhani and Kush Bora joining in for some technical trades. Do stay tuned. Welcome back. Well, let's discuss the market technicals now. We have Sudarshan Sukhani and Kush Bora joining us for that. Uh, gentlemen, good morning. Uh, Sudarshan, uh, we had a big down day yesterday, but looks like all those shots are going to get trapped and the market's going to have a big gap up. Uh, how do you approach it after that? Hi, good morning, Anush. See, yesterday I suggested we should sell it to strength. We got that price. And I'll, uh, I'm just repeating it because it's necessary. Uh, keep trades intraday because we have no idea how the market will behave over the, uh, overnight. And that's because corrections are difficult to trade in any sense. 
Therefore, the idea was to close your positions before the close of market. Now, today we are having a gap up. The gap up is so large that it's not easy to go long in this gap up. Otherwise, the trade today is to be long and tomorrow is a holiday and that's fine. I would suggest that be long and carry these positions into Thursday. But how do you enter? So you wait patiently for either a consolidation or a dip to go long today and carry the take take have the courage to carry this position into the holiday. Use uh, options uh, rather than futures and uh, be on the long side at least till Thursday. Okay, Kush, good morning. Uh, how would you approach the index today? Uh, sure, good morning, Anuj. In yesterday's show, we spoke about you know buying the dip because the global markets were expecting a recovery. We were expecting a recovery in global markets. And on Q, we saw that. And most of the gains, I'm afraid, are going to be eaten into by the gap up opening. So any dip close to 17,000 uh, has to be bought because we're close to, you know, we're opening close to the resistance of 17,200. Uh, that's the view on the Nifty. As far as the bank Nifty goes, that will uh, continue to remain under pressure because of the ongoing FII selling. So 37,800 and 38,800 is the range where we see bank Nifty. Here too, if we get any dip closer to 38,000, 38,100 levels uh, is, uh, you know, when we enter for a buy. Otherwise, it's a hold on the indices for now. Plenty of action, you know, in the stock specific, uh, you know, domain. Okay, plenty of action in the stock specific moves. All right, so tell us about that. Uh, Kush, the pharmaceutical space has really been gaining ground, right, over the last many days. Anything there that you like and uh, what else are you looking to buy or sell today? Well, I firmly believe that the strong will get stronger and that is by Cipla and Sun Pharma. Even though they've done fabulously well, they will continue to do well. So Sun Pharma and Cipla from the pharma space are, you know, on my radar. Uh, as far as the other stocks go, I have two picks, which is, you know, one is Axo Noble. The stock has shown tremendous strength. And even in the market fall, you know, it's been uh, doing you know, fabulously well. So uh, on a trading basis, the target here is 20 to 60 and the stop loss is 2190. The other is Indian Hotel, something we discussed as a BTSD trade yesterday. Here, the target would be 350 and the stop loss would be 330. Mm, okay. And so, Darshan, what are your stock picks? Well, uh, two of the stocks are stocks that have been outperforming. So we'll just go there and buy the outperformers. The first is Alchem. Alchem is a buy with the stock under 3240. And Bajaj Finance, another outperformer, is a buy with a stop under 7,100. Midla Soft is my only intraday short. That's a stop, that's an intraday short with a stop above 284. Don't short it at the, in the morning. Find an opportunity where it is facing price resistance. And ONGC is my final buy. It's not an outperformer, but I hope it will become one with a stop under 130. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Sudarshan and Kush, for that. Have a great day. We'll do one thing. We'll take a quick break. We'll come back with the pre-opening rates. Also, uh, the Federation of Automobile Dealers Association will be releasing their data for the month of September. Anytime now, we have Manish Rat Singhania, the president of the FADA of 